Have you ever known anyone or had to ever deal with things like osteoporosis? In this episode, we interviewed Dr. Doug, and he talks about the fact that you can actually reverse or at least help a lot when it comes to osteoporosis. Why would we talk about that? Because we want you to have a nice retirement. And by the end of this video, we hope to give you clarity as about your personal retirement plan and so that you'll have action items to make sure that you have a happy, secure retirement. To learn more about securing your retirement and all the different elements you need to know, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to be notified when we post a video every Monday. We have helped hundreds of our clients gain clarity and get on the path to a comfortable and happy retirement. Now it's your turn. Let's dive in. Welcome, everyone, to our Secure Your Retirement podcast. Merce and I are certainly very happy to have you here today. Uh, as you know, the uh, purpose of our podcast is to really hit three topics, uh, three different themes. One is all about financial, because we know that's important in retirement. The second one is lifestyle, and the third is legacy. Today, we're going to be talking about lifestyle. And um, you know, our, the, our average listener, our average client is someone who is 55 to really 75. That's kind of the, the core client and core listener. And we know that as we get uh, older, things begin to maybe change a little bit. And so we brought on a specialist today, Dr. D Doug Lucas, who is going to talk to us. We're going to talk today with Dr. Doug really around the idea of osteoporosis. Um, we felt that that would be a good topic. He's got a lot of different things that he's been trained on, and we'll get into that a little bit. So let me just say this first. Thank you very much for coming on and talking with us, Dr. Doug. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah. So, uh, Doug, you know, we, we had a little bit uh, to get to know you and uh, we would like to, our listeners to get to know you a little bit, too. Uh, we know that you're Stanford trained, so you've got a lot of knowledge, a lot of background in this world of uh, medicine, orthopedic surgeon specifically. Um, but tell us a little bit about your background and specifically you were in this what you call traditional healthcare model and then you transitioned out of that. So tell us about that transition and that journey for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like you said, I was an orthopedic surgeon by training, um, went through you know the traditional residency fellowship, finished up at Stanford and went into practice and did the traditional stuff. I took call, I fixed fractures. Um, and in that group of patients that I treated, I saw a lot of people that were falling um, from you know weak bones. You know, and they were people that either actually have their bones break and they would fall, or they would you know fall and break something. But what really left the impression on me was the impact that it had on their lives. Um, and it's something that we don't think a lot. Um, you know, as we're as we're aging, you know, you you obviously recognize it's things can happen, but the impact of some of these things can have on your life and, and a fractured hip or, you know, even a fractured arm or something doesn't really cross a lot of people's minds until they're on the other side of it. And they realize like, gosh, I, I did all of this stuff to prepare for retirement. And now I can't enjoy it the way that I wanted to. So, you know, in that group um, and a couple other different patient populations, uh, I, I really looked at how else I could serve people. I liked what I was doing um, and I was really good at what I was doing, but I found that I was, I was really drawn to helping people to prevent these things. So I, I made that leap from the traditional medical model to what I call health optimization, which is kind of a combination of you know, functional medicine, um, integrative medicine, precision health through genetics. Uh, but basically all of these different pathways put together to help people to go from what is our traditional model, uh, basic level of care to really where we need to be in order to, to optimize ourselves moving forward. Great. So I, uh, my, I, you know, my dad had me when he was a little bit later in life. Um, he was 52 when I was born. I now <clears throat> this year, I'm going to turn 50 myself and he was a very strong person, but he had that situation. Now, it happened a little bit later in life, but he fell, broke a rib and, and, and it changed his life health wise. My mom is now, now 84. She has somehow, I told her she's the best faller of all. She's fallen. I don't know about. 10 times, not broken anything yet, but we talk to her all the time about mom, if we don't have things in place and you fall and break a hip or you fall and break something, it's going to change your life. We saw that happen. We have many clients who tell us the same story. Unfortunately, we've had clients who themselves have dealt with that. So this idea, and I mean, you know, we, like I told you, we've got younger folks that are moving into retirement. Could you kind of just give us maybe 
what we're even talking about when you say osteoporosis and and that whole side of things could you just so we take it from the very beginning and saying what does that even mean sure. why do i need to know about it yeah and it's one of these things that it, it isn't talked about a lot in the medical community it's not really screened for it very effectively and it's not something that people bring up it's not sexy to talk about it uh, but it certainly has an impact when it when it hits you so what we're talking about when we say osteoporosis we're really talking about the diagnosis of having poor bone quality and poor bone really quantity, meaning the amount of actual minerals in your bone. And so your bones are these amazing organs in your body. They're very dynamic. Some people think of them as just you know the static structure of the body, but really they are constantly turning over. They're constantly making cells. They are protecting us in so many ways. Um, and they get stronger as we get older. And then they, they very reliably get weaker as we age after a certain point. And what a lot of people don't know is that that point in which your bones are at your strongest is very early in adulthood. You're talking, you know, late, late twenties, potentially like middle of that decade. Um, and that's it. And so from there, it's a downhill slide for the rest of your life, which is hopefully going to last for many decades after that. Um, and we don't talk to young people about building up good bone. We only talk to people about bone at the very end where we're trying to, you know, scrounge to get back as much bone quality and quantity as you can. So when we look at bones, we really want to say, you know, bone, uh, osteoporosis is the loss of bone quality and quantity and, and quantity being verified through the actual minerals, but quality of how strong they really are. Uh, and there's a huge difference there in how we test that. So when you, when I think about bones and I'm of that, I guess I'm, I'll be 35 this year. So that's not top of mind for me. Uh, and I've never broken anything either. So I've never had to worry about, you know, procedures or anything like that, knock on wood. Um, but so you, you earlier, you mentioned about the traditional model, which is, and let me guess, I guess that's prescribed medication and fix it with surgery if that, if, if medication doesn't work. So you also refer to this idea of health optimization. So tell me how, how the traditional model is different from what you're doing now and, and maybe related to how you diagnose and help with osteoporosis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the traditional medical model around osteoporosis, I mentioned briefly earlier about that we don't screen for it well. Um, and, and that's part of the problem is that a lot of people don't know that they have it. It's estimated that about 50 million um, adult Americans have osteoporosis. Uh, and that's a, obviously a pretty big chunk of the population. How many of those actually know that they have it is a much smaller percentage. I don't actually know that number. Um, and so when we talk about the traditional model, first of all, it's we're not screening for it. But let's say you you have a great doc and they do screen for it um, and you know that you have it. The recommendations are, as you said, they're basically built around the pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceuticals play a role, certainly, um, but they're, they're they're not great, honestly. And, and yes, they can prevent some things. They can help some things, but they need to be part of a bigger picture. Um, the other side of the traditional model is the, the fracture care. So let's say either you, you know you have it or you don't, but you fall and you have a bad fracture, whether it be a hip, a pelvis, um, you know, an ankle or you know, wrist or upper part of your arm. All of those things um, can have a significant impact on your ability to function. The care that occurs after that, there's not a great transition from the orthopedic side into whomever could be caring for the bone health. And that's part of the problem is that there's not a group that really captures onto that. There's not a subspecialist that said, I am a, a bone specialist person. I, because it, it really is, it's not the orthopedic surgeon, it's not the internal medicine doc, it's not the endocrinologist, it's not the rheumatologist, it's not all of these individual subspecialties. Nobody really wants that hot potato. And the reason why they don't want it is because it is a comprehensive picture and you really have to treat the whole thing. So that's where it falls into this health optimization field. When I went into the optimization side of, of healthcare, I was really focusing more on, you know, performance, um, trying to help you know, young professionals function at their best. That was kind of my, my interest out of the gate. To do that, I learned a lot about hormone optimization. I learned a lot about, uh, you know, gut health and adrenal health and how to manage things from a functional perspective. And when I realized what was happening with my osteoporosis patients, I realized, gosh, like this platform probably would work really well for these patients. So then I started getting into, okay, well, you know, what do these patients really need? Well, they really need somebody to figure out why they're losing bone. 
And they really need somebody to figure out, okay, how can we help regain bone through pharmaceuticals and beyond? Um, and then I started looking at the program that I built for optimization otherwise, and I thought, wow, it, it already exists. You know, we just need to start running people through it and change the tests up a little bit. Um, and now we've created this, this platform and we're really seeing some dramatic changes. So when you say that, I, I'm, I'm, assuming, okay, I'm gonna back up here a second. So I'm imagining that there's this <clears throat> optimal thing, which is start early, uh, start doing these things right. early. So our audience is where we are, okay? So we're 55 plus, you know, that's really our core audience. So uh, let me ask it this way, is it too late? And I know that's gonna be, that's not, that's probably too easy of a question because, <laughs> but what I mean is, is like, am I, can I really turn things or am I really kind of just saying, let's stop what's occurring? Yeah, no, you can absolutely, you know, turn the ship around. Um, and that's something that's really misunderstood is that a lot of the focus is on, okay, I want to prevent or slow down bone loss. And while that's, that's good, you should want to slow down bone loss, but ultimately we actually want to not only slow it down, we want to stop it. We want to reverse it. Uh, you know, are you going to get back to your peak bone health of when you were in your twenties? Probably not, you know, but can you prevent a fracture? it's very likely that you can. And, and that's ultimately the goal, right? Because it's not the osteoporosis that's the problem. It's the, the lifestyle changes that will occur after spine fractures and hip fractures and pelvis fractures. So what does someone do outside of just taking medicine? What does someone do to start turning that ship around? Like you said, is it yeah. a, a diet or is lifestyle changes or what, what are we looking at here? All, all of the above, Mers. And, and the reason why I say that is that it's the number one thing is figuring out why you're losing bone. And, and typically it's going to be two main things. One's going to be in the gut and it's, it's in the gut because you're not absorbing nutrients appropriately, or you have gut inflammation and it's you're causing this inflammatory response in your body, which will cause bones to lose mineral. Um, or it's in this, the other sources of chronic inflammation, which come from your adrenal glands um, in, in, in chronic um, uh, cortisol presence, just from stress. So that chronic stress, chronic inflammation will result in significant bone loss. Then once we figure out why you're losing bone, uh, and there's a hormone component to that too, which we can talk about later. But once we figure out why you're losing bone, you got to plug those holes, you know, picture it almost as in like holes in the roof and you want to just plug as many as you can. Once you get those holes plugged, then we got to start rebuilding things. Um, and so then that's the other side of it. And that is potentially replacing hormones if somebody's a candidate for that. And that's a, a, a longer conversation. Um, it's making sure that you are getting the right amount of nutrient, making sure that you're following a good diet that has adequate protein, the right kind of protein, and making sure that you're getting the right calcium, making sure that you're uh, absorbing all of those things, and then checking your, all your micronutrient status, both from a blood panel perspective, meaning where are you now, but also from a genetic perspective, meaning what are you susceptible to? Because not all of these things we can actually measure. So you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, they're not screening for this. They're not looking at this as not a typical practice. So let's say I'm listening to this uh, episode and I go, well, okay, this makes sense to me. Maybe you've got, like I've got, I've gotten two parents here who, you know, one of them actually did have a break and it, and it was life changing. I've got another one who I'm worried about for that. So I, you know, maybe it's top of mind for me, but let's say, okay, what's my first step. I'm listening to this. You're giving me these I know essence so far, big picture of what we need to look at. How do I go through this idea of saying, whether it be working, you know, with someone like you, or I got to go get information, like, how do I start the process to say, do I have a problem? Or how do I like, where am I out of whack at? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, if you're really starting from zero, meaning that you've never been screened, um, and you don't know anything about your bones, I, probably the most important thing is to have a conversation with somebody who can order a screening test. Um, and there's different tests and, and we can get into that if we have time, but ultimately just having a starting point is a great place. You know, um, if you have had a fracture and you can consider it a fragility fracture, which I can define for you, then you really need to get aggressive about finding the right provider. And I'll tell you that there aren't many of us in this, in this arena of taking a comprehensive approach to bone health. Um, let me just define fragility fracture real quick, because you're, I'm sure your audience will want to know. So if you have had a fracture that occurred as a result of minimal trauma, meaning like if you were in a car accident and you broke your arm because you got, you know, T-bone divided into the vehicle, that's not a fragility fracture. But if you tripped over your dog and you landed on your wrist and you broke the top part of your arm or you broke your hip when you hit the ground, 
the human body should be able to sustain that type of a fall and not fracture, kind of like, <laughs> like you mentioned. Um, and so if you fracture under those circumstances, you have osteoporosis by definition, um, and that requires a significant investigation. Mm. So obviously there's a lot to learn and a lot to, lot to think through here. And, um, and I know it seems like you're one of your, your biggest purpose is to educate as much as possible and help right. people realize uh, how big of a deal, not only osteoporosis, but the, the entire world of, of, of this side of medicine and what type of attention it deserves. So how can someone, I guess, reach out to you, learn more about you or, or your company or, uh, and be able to work with you? Yeah, so we actually created a, a, a mirror website for our company. So our, our main website is optimalhumanhealth.com. Um, and that's where we have the majority of our information. We created a mirror site for that called optimalbonehealth.com. My goal behind that website is to be able to provide, like you mentioned, as much information as I can. We're just now starting to get the blogs up and transferring stuff from other uh, areas and the resources page. But that'll be my goal is to provide this, this website, Optimal Bone Health, where people can go and to, to learn more, watch videos, content that I'm going to create, resources to other, um, other providers, specifically people that have good testing um, and good uh, avenues for management so that we can create as much of a community as we can. And, and, you know, we, we live in a world now where, especially since COVID, we've, we, a lot of the things we do is, is uh, you know, on Zoom where we can talk with somebody and, and have a conversation like this. I know that there are different programs like, you know, telehealth and that kind of stuff where you basically get on, the, on a, a, a video type thing where you're actually able to talk with someone. If, if we're looking at this kind of help, and like you said, that it's limited, does it require or is it best if I'm able to travel out to go see somebody like you that says, okay, I'm trying to deal with these things. Is it optimal to go out, but yet we can do it on video? Like what's the, what's the variances there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's always great to see people in person if I can, but I'll tell you, I've, I built this practice during COVID and I originally planned on having a great location where people could come to, but ultimately a lot of people don't want to travel right now. This particular audience is a lot of them, you know, they're not, they don't have the capacity to travel. Um, and so I, I say, let's just do it all telehealth. If we need somebody to lay hands on you, that's why we, we use your traditional healthcare providers, you know, have a primary care doc. But I consider a practice like ours, we're sort of in that next level up where this is the base level. We're up here trying to optimize your bones or optimize your performance, whatever it is. We can work with your traditional team if you need to go in and have somebody lay hands on you. But ultimately, there isn't much that I can't do through a telehealth visit. And at this point, almost 100% of my patients are all telehealth. And so if someone decides to engage with you and start that conversation in that first step, what does that whole process look like? Yeah, great question. So I, typically we start by engaging everybody in a, just a free consultation to learn more about them and make sure that we're a good fit. Because the last thing I want to do is put somebody through a whole bunch of testing that doesn't need it. Um, but so we would meet, I, I meet with everybody that wants to enter into our practice and we meet through a, a free, generally 15 to 30 minute conversation where we talk about the program and we learn about what's going on uh, with them and, and if we can help them. Um, assuming that they're a good fit, then we enter into the six month program. That six month program is going to be aimed at for the specifically for osteoporosis folks, you know, how can we achieve putting you in the right path so that we're going to improve your bone quantity and quality as much as we can. The first part of that, really the first month of that is all about gathering data. So you work with my coach, my coach has a master's in nutrition, she's a registered dietitian and a life coach. She talks a lot about the lifestyle stuff. You work with me to look at some lifestyle interventions. While we're talking about all that stuff, we're getting all this objective data. So we're getting the genetics, we're doing the functional testing on your gut, on your adrenal glands. And then we're also getting an extensive lab panel, which is gonna tell us how quickly are you losing bone, um, how, how quickly are you building bone? What does that mismatch look like? What do your hormones look like? All those other things we mentioned earlier. That stuff takes about a month to cook and, and get done. Once we have all those results, then I sit down with the patients for an hour. We go over all of it. Uh, and then we come up with a plan that's gonna include supplementation, lifestyle, including nutrition, exercise, um, you know, stress mitigation, um, and optimizing sleep. But then we also talk about uh, hormones, we talk about peptides, we talk about medications. I have all of my patients do a, a consult essentially with their case with this, uh, my PA that works with me. He is a, a, 
an osteoporosis medication wizard. He works with the National Osteoporosis Foundation. So we talk about all of these cases as a group and come up with a plan. Now, whether or not they actually want to go on medications is a whole other topic, but I want them to know what the best approach is based on our, uh, based on our history and their case. And then they can make that decision if they want to use pharmaceuticals or not. And I would say most of my patients don't. Um, and then they do that intervention for about four months. We repeat things near the end to make sure that some of these things are headed in the right direction. It would be too early to see difference on a test like a DEXA test. It really takes about a year to two years to see changes in bone quality and quantity, but all of the other metrics like gut health, micronutrients, all those things we can actually measure though. And we know that you're headed in the right direction. At the end of six months, people can either choose to repeat that and do it again and continue to dial in, or they can just take that information and continue to head off in the right direction, knowing that they need to repeat their DEXA testing or preferably some other better forms of testing you know, at certain intervals. Um, and generally, it's going to be the, the year and two-year mark. So I know this is probably a completely different topic that we could talk a, a whole entire episode on, but could you give us kind of a an easy definition or, or explanation of what you mean when you say gut health. I mean, I hear that, you know, and I've heard that through different things I've read and everything, but could you just kind of say, Hey, this is what I'm talking about when I say check, you know, like look at your gut health. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you two different versions of it. Um, so the gut is again, it's a, it's another amazing organ. It is, I, I call it a, it's like a crazy organ. It does so much work to keep bad stuff out and let good stuff in. It is this very long interface between basically the inside of you and the outside of you, but it's all on the inside of you. It's, it's crazy actually that it works. But when we talk about gut health, it's really the ability for the gut to do what it is designed to do. So can it hold things out that it's supposed to hold out or is it letting stuff seep through the cracks? Um, so we call that gut permeability or leaky gut. I screen all my patients for leaky gut. Specifically though, for the bone health patients, I also want to know how is the gut working? When the gut does absorb food, it has to break it down. And in order to break it down, you have to get things that are secreted from different organs along the way. How much of those things are secreted, what the levels of those things are, how you're breaking down food products makes a huge difference in how you can build up your bones and have the appropriate nutrients. So for my osteoporosis patients, I do both gut permeability or leaky gut, and then I also look at gut function. There's a lot of other stuff you can look at in the gut and gut health is, it's a pretty broad topic. Um, but I think that everybody needs to know a little bit about their gut and how it's functioning because most of us, I'll tell you, cause I screen all my patients. Most of us have dysfunctional gut. Well, I do agree. I think that could be a completely different podcast, but I know that we've <laughs> learned a lot today with you, Dr. Doug. Thanks a lot for hopping on with us and uh, sharing some of your insights and your goals and your mission and, and uh, with our listeners. And uh, we appreciate your time. Yeah, Maris Raiden. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. All right. And for anybody listening, we will make sure that we have all of the links uh, and everything to the websites that you mentioned. Uh, that'll be on our website, on your show page, as well as in any show notes, all that kind of stuff. It'll all be easy for people to get access so they can know how to go and check you out. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. We hope this video has given you some confidence and clarity as you plan for a worry-free life in retirement. But what else do you need? We have created a complimentary video course called Three Keys to Secure Your Retirement. This video walks you through step-by-step -step what you need to do to get ready for retirement. You can also check out our podcast called Secure Your Retirement. You can subscribe below. For more retirement tips, watch this video, Create Your Retirement Income Plan. Also, click here to subscribe to our podcast, Secure Your Retirement. If you like this video, hit the like button and be sure to subscribe and share it with your friends.